I love to tell stories about complex and contradictory people. The screenplay covers 1964 through 1978 when my father was killed. And the thing that's interesting about Bob is, is just the uh, you know contradictory nature of, of who he appeared to be and, and who the man really was. It engages your imagination and it allows you to take a walk in someone else's shoes. Bob had issues. Sony Pictures Classics presents the new movie from acclaimed filmmaker Paul Schrader. Action! Autofocus. Schrader, writer of Raging Bull and Taxi Driver and director of American Gigolo and Affliction, brings together Greg Kinnear and Willem Dafoe. This could be what you're looking for. Set in a German prison camp. <laughs> in a revealing look at the exploits of one of the 60s most beloved TV personalities. Play Bob Crane, who came at a time when, um, for so many, I think, in my generation, we're just kind of TV junkies to begin with. But then you had this guy who was so cool, who knew how to deal with the Germans in such an amazing way, and always heroic and funny. And, uh, you know, we, I, I was a fan. Kinnear was sort of tailor-made for Bob Crane, the same sort of man, the same personality, in many ways the same image. Greg Kinnear, big fan of his, and he's captured the essence of my dad. He's got that spirit, he's got smile. Greg Kinnear is going to blow people's mind in this movie. <laughs> he's so incredible. I mean, besides the physical appearance, you know, completely changing himself with the prosthetics, um, emotionally, the turn he's done is just phenomenal. It's interesting because no one can really predict what can happen when someone becomes famous, what that does to people. Play Hogan, don't you? I sure do. You want an autograph? I've got autographs. Darling, <laughs> you just stop that. Mr. Crane is an happily married man. And it certainly tries to explore a little bit what would cause him to lose his family, the people that he loved, uh, all for, you know, sex, really. I'm a real it's not easy to resist temptation. There's a number of very interesting themes. Mr. Crane, I am such a fan. I just wonder if could picture I... together? You betcha. There is this whole notion of sexual addiction and the corrosiveness of celebrity. And the changing of the notion of being an American man at a certain time. If you're into it, one of my clients is having a party up in the hills on Friday. Lots of ladies could be fun. John Carpenter was uh, a very unfortunate association for Bob to have come across. They s sort of abet each other's uh, weaknesses. Which one do you want? Uh, what, 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 what are you thinking? These two are ready to get it on. Well, you're the man, so I figure you get first choice. You also have uh, the advent of home video. Well, what will we do with it? Home movies. And this uh, allows Crane to take his photo hobby into live action. I do my best work in front of the camera. I do mine behind. <laughs> this is, it's fabulous. And eventually let it sort of take over his life. Hey, a day without sex is, is a, a day, day wasted. wasted. Some of the scenes read like scenes between a husband and wife. <laughs> <laughs> like a little domestic scenes, but it was between two heterosexual men. So much for our big plans. Don't give me that look. This, this is good for both of us. Oh, is it? Yeah. I'm back in play again. The big time. They had this in incredible intimacy and incredible dependency on each other. So, this is the party? Colonel? Apparently some of the new recruits are complaining about the barracks again. Hold on! <laughs> <laughs> Willem Dafoe is, uh, you know, the quintessential uh, American actor, I think, and he just, uh... I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Willem has become John Carpenter, right? <laughs> I have to work for my living, okay? Willem Dafoe just kind of cruises in. He's got it. You'll change your mind. I'll change my mind. Are you deaf? 
Huh? Good point. All right? We're, we're still friends, right? The Scottsdale Police Department always felt that it was John Carpenter as the, uh, the murderer. There's elements of uh, lightness to this, and there's plenty of elements of darkness to it, but uh, it's definitely a unique view. I would say more provocative than anything. I don't know. And it'll be graphic as well, and, and that's Paul Schrader too, right? The film begins in a very organized way. It goes from this kind of world of uh, button-down Americana uh, gradually to a more cluttered and bleached out and uh, shakier in terms of a camera image world. This movie is so much about style, and I mean, they are, you know, the shots, it's a mystery to me. I usually know what the shot's gonna look like. I usually know what the camera's doing. I have absolutely no idea. I like that. I enjoy watching it. I enjoy people that kind of uh, push the envelope a little bit. If I were to send you out again, I'd have to be able to tell people you're a new man. Well, tell them sex is normal. It's good for you, I'm normal. I, I don't know how this story will, will come out, but, but this, uh, certainly won't be like any other I think most audiences have seen. That's inspirational. You're a fortunate man. Yes, I am. The following program contains scenes of a graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. This program is a compilation of interviews and footage taken from various law enforcement agencies, court records, and individuals. Any opinions expressed are their own. The person who stumbled into this was Victoria Berry, who was Bob's co-star in Beginner's Luck. And she'd come to the apartment. He'd given her the blue key, the copy, to the Winfield apartment. There were three uh, blank keys that were used for that, and Bob had one, and she'd gotten one. She shows up a little earlier than her appointed time, which was one, I believe, in the afternoon, uh, approximately one o'clock. Um, she knocked. Um, there was no answer. She noticed that the morning newspaper was outside the apartment on the stoop there. She picked that up, knocked again, no answer. She tried the knob, the door was unlocked. She pushed it open and she noted that the interior of the apartment was darkened. The apartment is totally dark. You cannot really see in the apartment without turning the light on because Crane had put all these very, very thick drapes up to hide, you know, all the pornography that he had, to hide the uh, photos that he was doing, to hide what he was doing during the day and as night with all the wind he was bringing back. So when she opens the door, she goes from the very bright sun of Arizona to the very dark room where Crane's body was found. And then she closes the door behind her. At that point, it's extremely dark and she doesn't turn the light on. She's calling Bob, Bob, um, no answer. She goes on into the interior of the apartment, notices a, uh, a bedroom door ajar. Everything is darkened, all the drapes are pulled. She goes to the door, um, looks in and sees a rough outline of someone on the bed and she walks a little closer thinking that it's a female due to the darkened head area. And at that point in time, she noticed that it was blood, coagulated blood. Now, Bob had told Victoria Berry a story about a woman he'd gone out with who'd been distraught and cut her wrist. And she thought, first thing she thought, this has happened again. She bends forward a little closer. And he's sleeping, you know, sort of like this, like it's a, he was asleep at the time of his death when somebody, when somebody clubbed him. And she thinks, okay, it's John Carpenter because he always stays with Bob. 
Now, this body is just chocolate sauce almost. You've got to imagine, this is just an unrecognizable person. Then she sees a very expensive French watch on Bob Crane's wrist. She realizes it's Bob. She then went, ran screaming from the apartment and, uh, and got assistance from some neighbors, and they called us Gusto PD. The first police officer who showed up at the scene was Paulette Cassetta. Paulette ended up, believe it or not, being my investigator on the case when I took over the case 14 years later. She left the Scottsdale Police Department and worked with the Public Defender's Office. She knew what she was doing. The first thing she did was close the door, get Victoria Berry away from the scene, stick her in her car, and then phone for backup. When we arrived at the scene, there were obviously uniformed officers already there. Uh, they had locked the scene down. There was an officer on the door. There was an officer and I believe a sergeant with uh, Victoria Berry. Other people start arriving, and later this was uh, one of the criticisms of the case. This crime scene, what, there were just tons of people smoking and using the phone, and it was not a good crime scene. But you have to say this for Scottsdale PD. They didn't get murders. This was especially a celebrity murder. Well, Lieutenant Dean and Lieutenant Morganhagen arrived, and they took charge. When I got to the scene, uh... I was met by, I, I believe, Lieutenant Dean and Captain Pratt and uh, I think uh, Detective Passell uh, might have been there. He might have been out uh, checking with neighbors at the time. We were instructed to do a knock around the, uh, knock on doors around the apartment complex to see if anybody had heard anything or seen anything. And that was in the beginning stages within the first few minutes of arriving on the scene. The whole group of detectives, the whole group of cops all stormed the apartment. They all walked in. They started looking around. They started looking at lifting things up. And they started turning lights on. Um, and then they got to the point, which was absurd, where they brought Barry, who had supposedly seen this horrific scene, and they said, come on back in. The apartment was crowded with people smoking, and Victoria Barry was smoking. And there's always been some criticism that she was allowed to smoke at the crime scene, that anybody else were actually to do that. But as I can understand it, that they'd already dusted for prints. They'd already done a lot of this work before she began smoking. But she was extraordinarily freaked out. She's pacing and smoking and so on. The other thing was, is uh, one of the investigators was using the phone. And again, I've been reassured that it was dusted for prints, but I'm not sure on that. It was a muddy crime scene. There was no, uh, no forced entry that uh, we could find. The uh, apartment was in a state of disarray, not necessarily from, you know, suspect ac activity after the homicide occurred, but uh, it was just unkept, would be the best description. There was video equipment all over the living room. There was videotapes laying about. The scene itself was in the bedroom, uh, and under lighted conditions, it was observed that the individual had been bludgeoned to death. Pretty, pretty grotesque scene. Mr. Crane was laying on the bed in a, a kind of a fetal position. There was a lot of blood around his head and, and on his neck. And uh, I did observe spatters, uh, blood spatters on the wall above the headboard of the bed. And then there were some, uh, looked like white marks on the sheet where something full of blood had been wiped off and uh, I noticed a cord uh, tied around his neck. 